Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, race, gender, and money. How do they hook up? Feminist Zila Eisenstein will be on the program. We'll also visit with the Damayan Cleaning Cooperative, the first Filipina migrant worker-owned cooperative in the United States. All that and a few words from me on the intersectional transformation we desperately need. Welcome to our program. When Pope Francis paid his historic visit to the United States, our next guest admired that he spoke on behalf of the poor and against the excesses of capitalism. But she also expressed her frustration at the risk of being a feminist killjoy. She wrote, quote, no one can successfully address poverty or inequality without recognizing the structural dependence between capitalism and racialized patriarchy. Suffering, in other words, is not economic alone. It's an argument Zila Eisenstein's been making for close to 40 years in her capacity as a professor at Ithaca College and in her writings. Among her many important books are Capitalist Patriarchy and the Case for Socialist Feminism, Against Empire, and The Color of Gender, Reimagining Democracy. I'm very glad that this moment welcomes her to our program. I'm so glad to have you here, Zila. Thank you. I have my copy. Do you see this? From 19, I guess, 80 two or something. Uh, I'll, I'll have you sign it later. Uh, but, but let's start at the, with the basics. This whole idea of suffering is more than economic. Um, it's pretty crude as far as you're concerned, but can you just lay it out for people that maybe need a moment to grasp what you're saying? Well, it is to say that um, economic existence, life, you know, problems, they never exist uh, without uh, a location of an individual person with a body. And that body is always raced, and it's, um, it has a sex, it has a gender, um, it can even be fluidly so. So the, the point here, historically, in that book, was really um, the simple point that capitalism uh, was first patriarchal, and then when you get rid of capitalism, you're still left with mm. patriarchy. How would you like the Pope to have talked about capitalism? Or how would you have liked we in the media to talk about the Pope? Because there was kind of silence to all the uh, questions you're raising. Right. I mean, my criticism is as much to the media and progressives who were embracing him um, for the way that they really condoned his silences. And um, the question of how you name the system of capitalism, it is capitalist patriarchy. It's actually capitalist, racist, heterosexist patriarchy. And for people who want to say, well, that's just too many words, I think that the only way we see things as if they're named. Mm. You called it uh, intersectional. You say capitalism is intersectional. Right. Yes. Well, in, in, in the earliest work I did, along with many black feminists, actually, we talked about capitalism and patriarchy being mutually dependent, mm -hmm. um, that they were, um, as Barbara Smith would have said, marbled, you know, um, and actually the term of intersection was somewhat questioned at that time as being too linear, mm. as though you have lines intersecting. Because reproduction of um, slave labor force, creating capitalism in America required rape. Can you lay out a little bit more about what you mean about how these two relate, capitalism well, and patriarchy? Well, to the extent that even people talk about slavery as though chattel slavery, as though it is a system of racism, mm -hmm. it is as deeply a system of uh, misogyny and sexism. Mm -hmm. So the only way that slavery got reproduced was by the misuse and rape of enslaved black women. Mm -hmm. It was central to the system, yet when people talk about slavery, they speak of it as though it is a system of racism. Now my point is, yes, absolutely, but it is racialized patriarchy, it's patri patriarchal racism, and actually maybe that's why we haven't done a sufficient mm. job of getting rid of the slave system in the United States. So help us with the history a little bit. I mean, I went back to a page that Ithaca College put up celebrating the many years you'd been there, and their first entry is a forum that you held, Is Feminism Dead, in 1979. Um, what 
have been the junctures at which you think we perhaps went down the wrong road or something else could have happened? Well, I think that, you know, the junctures ca are actually made just out of history. Sure. So there are moments when uh, there has been a challenge for a feminist to stand up and take notice. Um, most of the time in the United States, the mainstream liberal and now neoliberal factions of feminism win because they they really are the most powerful. And that's what was happening, kind of, at 79, 80, right. something right. there. Right. But then, then there really were issues uh, related to, um, well, the fall of the Soviet Union, um, then the Bosnian War. I mean, there were more and more issues that brought a kind of radical feminism to the forefront. Mm -hmm. And um, with the rape camps in Bosnia, the, uh, the idea, again, that, that, that legal equality is not the same thing as mm -hmm. freedom or liberation. And, um, of course, that was historically a huge distinction. Yeah. How do you define radical feminism? Okay, radical feminism, um, it, it really develops in the early 70s. Its height was through the 70s. The, and what was their brilliant um, contribution to both feminist theory and to politics in general was really the idea that women form a sexual class. Mm -hmm. And that was really trying to say that there's more than economic classes. Mm -hmm. Women are a sexual class. The, the problem with it was that they then didn't take the economic classes and really create the intersections, that it's not one sexual class, it's a sexual class that shares the system of misogyny and its problems, but it's differentiated along right. economic and racial lines. And racial lines. But, but I do think that the least recognized, brilliant form of politics, and I was not a radical feminist, is radical feminism. Well, I ask about radical feminism because it's now the term some people are using as they exclude trans people. Um, have you had that experience? Well, yes, I have. Uh, but first to say that radical feminism historically and, and for probably a couple of decades really was an enormously inclusive concept about the female body, whatever, however it um, was expressed, okay, but it was it was not used to exclude, so um, but rather to problematize mm. what all people face living as women. Mm -hmm. All right. So today, um, fast forward, you know, about three decades, right, or three and a half decades, there has been a kind of appropriation, I think, of the term radical feminism that has no recognition for me to its earlier meaning. Mm. Um, because actually to uh, the exclusion of trans women as not truly female and therefore not truly women uh, is, is really rooted in a construct that de denies the social, cultural, political definition mm. of what it means to be a woman. Mm. So that the purism of, of really being able to say that a trans woman is not a mm. woman. Because I mean, you went to a conference of radical feminists and what happened? Well, it was a conference dedicated to Sholemeth Firestone, who was an incredible architect of the early radical feminism. And um, at the conference, there was a lot of contestation over whether trans women should be allowed in. Mm -hmm. And when I was asked, uh, when I asked about it, I did say if, uh, if trans women are not allowed in, then I, I will not attend. Um, also, in, at the same time, uh, in London, there was a conference that really faced that as a huge problem, mm -hmm. and the conference got closed down as a result of that mm -hmm. conflict. Mm -hmm. But to me, th these really are diversions. And, um, and the idea here is to open the meaning of identity, yeah. not to close it down. You were one of the first, and I think 
still probably one of the few feminist critics of Thomas Piketty's work when it came out. His bestseller, although I don't know how many people actually read it, called Capital. Um, he too, even in this era or in this era, seems to have made all the same mistakes um, that you were criticizing 40 years ago from left economists. Um, do you want to talk a bit about your critique of Piketty? Well, it's, um, it's really pretty much, I've already said yeah. it, you know, on the level that for him, his, his study of capital um, that he does has no uh, consistent analysis of the relationship of um, the slave trade to the way that, I mean, he mentions it, but he does not. It is not theorized mm -hmm. and understood as part of the problem of capital. Mm -hmm. You know, um, he also has no recognition of the multiple forms of labor that women are constantly um, producing and reproducing in the labor force, whether it's domestic or consumer mm -hmm. labor, the multiple forms of it, not a mention now, of it. Now, those forms of labor are getting quite a, are getting a new look these days as people talk about what's going to re-stimulate our economy, what's going to change our economy. The McKinsey report recently uh, released talked about the added value that could appear in the gross domestic product of different countries if we included women's unpaid caring work uh, for children, for old people, housework. Um, I think they said in the United States alone that unpaid work constituted something like $1.5 trillion in value. Um, do you see hope there? or is, Are you interested in, in that discussion? Is that a useful place for us to be looking? Well, I'm interested in anything. I know you, you are. Know. <laughs> but that said, n it, it gets in my way because it, it even the distinction between domestic and, and, and then paid labor uh -huh. force, I mean, that is a structural constraint that is both racist and misogynist at its heart. So the idea here that I'm going to say, okay, well, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, what was it, 30 years ago, they said a housewife is worth uh, twenty five thousand right. eight hundred whatever wages for housewife. You know, so but um, so re where does that get us? We're supposed to pay the housewife. So that's not about restructuring. And so the issue that has become more in the forefront, which is the uh, the the tension between individual and structural power, for some reason, sex, gender, and race always take second seat to the idea of what is structural. Mm -hmm. And I am sick of it. <laughs> well, it takes us back to that brilliant slogan, the personal is political. I, I don't know why that hasn't received more scrutiny over time or more attention. It has to be one of the great insightful slogans of our time. It is totally, I mean, I, I wouldn't call it a slogan to the extent that it came out of such rich intervention into where is power located. And it was really div saying that, the, that there is a politics to sex, that the public is private and the private is public. It was really a total mm. realignment of what those relationships are. And is that the direction any of our conversations are going around, what a lot of people call the new economy, um, as we think of reimagining? Is that concept front and center anywhere that's getting you excited? Do you see any models of people who are thinking about gender in this new economy? Well, most of the work that I've seen on the new economy doesn't do that. Um, but. That doesn't mean that it couldn't very easily start to do that. So encourage them. Yeah. How well, so? So, well, it would be really to try to unsettle some of the categories of really what is, you know, considered to be um, invisible labor or what is considered to be um, uh, the unpaid force or what is it, the affective labor. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of those terms on some level, if they're not interrogated, become reproductive of the system mm -hmm. of, of misogyny and the, and the lessening of the value. But I also think we live in such complex times that this affects men and women, males and females. It's, you know, no, it, labor is not as um, uh, divided right. um, as it used to be. Mm -hmm. So, and, and we also need to be thinking newly about that.
Ela Eisenstein. You can get a list of the books that you could read or have on your shelf at our website. Thanks so much for coming in. Oh, thank you so much. You might like to know that you can listen to this show as well as watch it and hear all our interviews on our weekly podcast. It's available at our website, thelfshow.org. The movement for cooperative ownership is gaining ground in New York City. Producer Jonathan Klett brought us this report from Damayan. The word means to help each other. This is the Damayan Cleaning Cooperative. Because uh, economic power can lead to social justice, right? So that's what we're trying to do. And let's make it work. <laughs> we thought of the co-op as a way of helping our members, particularly the families of trafficking survivors, because they came here at the worst time, as we know. You know, there are no jobs for the older children. The mothers and the fathers, especially who came here, could not find jobs. A business should not really make the boss rich and very rich <laughs> and make the workers poor and so poor that you know you cannot you know, uh, support you know, children to school, uh, right? You cannot have you know, a dignified life here. Our people don't have jobs and so we get out of the country and end up becoming domestic workers here. Damayan has a campaign against labor trafficking. Many domestic workers who work for diplomats and other really powerful employers, you know, find themselves in trafficking situations. We have supported about three dozen traffic workers. I'm um, one of the labor trafficking survivor. I came here because of the invitation for the church as a missionary. In my contract, there's a promise that after two years, they can be able to adjust my status. I was approached by the leader that they will give me, my continental director will give me a special mission. It was like a, secretary, a personal secretary, but it was not true. I was doing the domestic worker. I was with the young kids, three kids. That was through 24 hour job. I, I don't have salary. That was three years. 2003, I managed to escape to, because they wanted me to go home. This family was taking advantage for me. I don't have anything, that's why I don't want to go back to Philippines. It's, it's really hard there. I'm gonna start from the scratch, and what kind of job I, I'm gonna find in my country. So, in short, so it was really hard. I'm very exploited. It was really very controlling. They took my passport as soon as I came to America. They took the pa my passport, my documents. When you work individually, especially if you're in the uh, domestic work industry, you're on your own. But if you have a co-op, you know, you're the boss. You set the wage rate. You set the work conditions, we thought that maybe we can make our own business. 
Right now, we have a small contract from one of our ally organizations, the Nature Conservancy. So the unfair economic system is global and we have to break it, right? Breaking it, you know, will not end to helping individual workers retrieve stolen wages or helping an individual trafficking survivor get a trafficking visa and get her family over here. Change, you know, uh, will not be affected by a small, isolated victories. It should be systemic. And in my view, a cooperative can do, can show the workers, you know, how a systemic change should be. will bring us together like the guests for what I experienced that's my story but the rest is different for me but if you put them together it's like yeah we needed a job we need one decent job we want a fair wages it's like we are putting together the power of the women power of the workers <laughs> yeah. we need to effect change and who will be the real agents of change I believe it will be the workers, the people who are directly affected will be, you know, the agents to change the system that are not really working for them. We have to do something. So this cooperative and the cooperative movement should show working people, you know, which way to go. If capitalism is not working, cooperatives should show that through collective work, good jobs, fair wages, dignity, and equal opportunities for all, you know. Maybe it can happen, right? That report on the Damayan Co-op from our very own Jonathan Klett. Capital is intersectional, says guest Zila Eisenstein on the Laura Flanders show this week. People with bodies labor, which means that the capital they produce is immersed in race and gender. Just like the bodies that make it, wealth's not colorless or gender free. So anyone who pretends otherwise just isn't serious about reducing inequality. With gender equality more of a priority than ever, women still represent 70% of the world's poor, according to the United Nations. They earn less than men, about half as much, even in advanced economies, even as they do more work, almost two and a half times as much when you include unpaid labor. And inequality between rich and poor women isn't shrinking, it's growing, reports the UN. In the U.S., a 2011 study found that fully 40% of single female heads of household were living in poverty, and the numbers for women of color were even worse. Sure, the rise of extremism, war, and the concentration of financial and corporate power hasn't helped. Still, in these same two decades, women have gained legal rights, rights they can defend in court, more girls have gone to school, more women have gotten elected and become leaders. So what's going on? Today's inequalities can't be explained simply by the lack of legal rights or discrimination, says the United Nations, nor are they inevitable. What we know from our guests, women like Aijin Pu of the National Domestic Workers Alliance or Saru Jayaraman of the Restaurant Workers, is that equality hasn't come from access to more precarious and poisonous jobs or an ever-expanding workday. The gig economy isn't the answer either. What's needed is fundamental change, what many are calling the next new system. But that has got to come with explicit attention to racial and gender justice. In 2016, The Laura Flanders Show will be producing a series of special reports on race, gender, and the next economy with our friends at the Democracy Collaborative. Tell us what you think. If capital's intersectional, what's our intersectional transformation going to look like? And where do you see it happening? And find all my reports and interviews at the lfshow.org website. So tell me what you think. Write to laura at the lfshow.org. And thanks.
What would our world look like today if our media showed us as much collaboration as they do competition? What if we got to meet people making change right here, right now, in all sorts of ways we're usually told are impossible? Subscribe today to The Laura Flanders Show for in-depth interviews with forward-thinking people. Smarts, not sound bites, every week, right here. Subscribe, and thanks. Black land matters this week on the Laura Flanders Show. There's always been a backstory of mm. cooperative financial movements behind those social movements. And then we take a look at a few initiatives to do that again today. What this workshop does specifically in breaking down what a cooperative does is empowers people. That is where I kind of lay most of my hope for, for change in this neighborhood. Today on the show, Jalal Sabur and Ray Figueroa tell us how they're connecting farming to restorative justice. The character of real estate development thus far in New York City has been very, very predatory, very rapacious. We're talking about gaining our power through land. And fisherman Bren Smith talks about saving the earth and jobs with kelp. All that and a few words from me on giving thanks and growing food power. <laughs> 